Tirade. It's a podcast that allows old friends to laugh, banter, get serious, or none of that. As always, my name's Sean, and I'm joined by my co-host Paul, Adam, and Christian. So, fellas, I'm sure you're wondering, what in the world are we talking about tonight? Yeah, I'm well, scared. <laughs> uh, no reason to be scared. Um, I'm scared. I'm always okay. scared. Okay, you can be scared. That's fine. The world is a scary place. I, I thought I would allow you all to make today's topic either as serious or humor-filled as you all see fit. And we'll see how in just a moment. Gentlemen, I need you to imagine this. It is a beautiful fall day in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. The woods are exceptionally beautiful this time of year, and you decide to travel off the beaten path and explore parts of the woods you had never been to before. As you are traversing the leaf-laden ground, you begin to hear what sounds like muffled screams in the distance. This is quite upsetting to you, and although your fight-or-flight response has kicked in and caused the hairs on your neck to stand straight, you feel compelled to see if there are people in need of your help. As you crest the ridge ahead, you look down and you see four women tied to what appears to be an old abandoned cold cart track. Before you are able to descend the ridge you're currently standing on, you observe a single male victim tied to another track directly adjacent to that one. I think you might see where this is going. (laughs) (laughs) Oldest question in the history. Is there also a guy with like a top hat? And like a long curly mustache, like twisting his fingers, and going. <laughs> well, there weren't, there wasn't, but now there is. As if something out of a horror movie, you quickly jolt your head to the direction of a sharply inclined hill that the track seems to originate from, and what seems or what looks like to be a mine cart is squealing down the track at a rapid pace, descending toward the four women. You notice a handle that you can reach. Uh, to potentially change the direction of the cart to divert who the man in, instead of the women. You only have seconds to decide. Will you choose to intervene? Which way is it heading forward initially without it's, any... It's going towards the women. Describe the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Describe the women, please. <laughs> okay, the women... Um... Roll a perception check. No, uh, the women are, the women are. Uh, I don't know, mid twenties. I mean, they're they 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 they're bound. Uh, you, it's obvious something out of like a Saw movie almost, right? Like you don't know how the heck they got there, but they're most definitely in peril. They're babes in the woods. Babes in the woods. Babes in the woods. There's four of them. Times four. All right, All right. I got six seconds to think, but. I'm gonna use this hour podcast to to, to figure it this out. Is, this is uh, how we're starting the podcast. Okay, this is not the, the entire podcast. Okay, the trolley question. problem is not the right, entire. No, no, no. I'm gonna get real specific here. Uh, w- how far away am I from the lever that needs to be pulled to make the change? Compared to how long is it gonna take until I can no longer make a decision? Like. Essentially, imagine that you're on a ridge, and below you are is the track where you're you're observing this uh, it, horrible thing happening. For some m- mystical reason, or whatever the case may be, the lever is within your reach distance on the ridge, so you will have the capability to adjust the lever where you're standing, but not enough time to make it down to the track. All right, so I'm, and how much time would I actually, in reality, how much time do I have to think about this? I'd say you have at at best, at absolute best, eight to ten seconds. All right, I don't think I'm touching anything. If I'm gonna be real with you guys, I don't, I don't Either. think, I, I don't, I, I don't think in the moment I would have enough to go on to know exactly what to do, like. I would be in a, a state of disbelief. Like, is this really the lever situation that's happening in your <laughs> life? I'd be like, is this a dream? And in that moment, I've already lost five seconds, but <laughs> I don't know, like, if the, what I the mean, lever does, I would have can, not enough time. Are we supposed to imagine that we have full understanding of 
which oh. way the cart is already going and what the lever will do. No, and that that's something to it, right? Like in my mind, in my peanut brain, myself, I'm going up. I'm like, oh crap, break! And I'm going to pull that lever, imagining that it might stop it for some reason. Even though in reality, there's no way that would work that way. I don't know, but in my peanut brain, that's probably yeah. the first. Thing. I wouldn't even think of the trolley problem. I would probably think, ah, oh, stop, pull thing. And I can't uh, like jump in front of the cart to try to. Like- no way. That's tough, but I'd have to weigh out. Like I know it's a numbers game in some in some way, but I'd look at it like, can I live with the inaction causing something that was out of my control versus the the reaction of me actually doing something, technically being the reason why life is lost. You know what I mean? Like four women die if I don't do anything. That's not my fault, and I could probably work my way out of that psychologically. Whereas if I make a decision split decision without actually giving a real consideration and I pull that lever, I just doomed someone to die. Even though I saved four lives, that might be harder for me to struggle with. Uh, so that's my answer. Okay. I mean, you don't know you're saving four lives, right? You don't know which You don't know anything, yeah. So, yeah. And, so yeah. If, if that was the case, I would just be like, I could hit this and and I could flip this and it would hit the four women. I don't know which way it's true. Yeah, I really don't know exactly. Exactly. I'm probably just gonna do nothing. I so do we? But you said like from what we can see, it seems like if we flip it, it's gonna go towards the guy, right? If it's it, like a reasonable assumption. It's a, it's a reasonable assumption to make. Yeah, that's why. That's why it's important. Like, I would, I clear, I would immediately identify this as the trolley situation, and I'd be, <laughs> but like at the, at the same time, if I had more time, like if I had like an hour to sit down and think, in not maybe not an hour, like maybe a couple of minutes or something, and I knew that well, there was no way. Everything- if you yeah. had that much time, then anything you choose is like you are actively participating at that point. You are at, if you have a whole hour to decide to kill or not kill someone, you are an okay. Active okay, let's pretend like there is someone evil involved, and and I can they, they got a gun pointed at me or something, and and I, this is less to do about the train and more to do about do I choose to end? Do I choose to let four people die versus? the one person died and it was more as a test to me as a as a as opposed to saving lives or whatever that's a different thing because uh i actually don't know what i would do in that situation because i really haven't thought this through entirely okay well i will say i would pull the lever if i thought it would send the cart towards the guy because i'm that's just the numbers game that's what I would do. Although I would hope that uh, some of those women are like physically fit or maybe even ripped because I don't know who tied them to this track and we <laughs> might have to fight somebody in a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if I guess if I knew what I was doing and I knew I could send it, like I, I've consciously understood that I could either send it to hit the guy or send it to hit the girls. I, I would probably do the same thing. I'd be like one losing one is not as bad as losing four. Okay. But if it was just like, I didn't know what was happening. And like, this was like the first time I'd ever real life seen one of these like levers in real life. And it's like, I need to make a split second reaction. I'm probably just going to be like, uh, what? And just like yeah. kind of look really stunned and just be like, oh shit, that just happened. Is there Oops. blood on your hands if you choose to not pull the lever? Even though it's um, a numbers game, is there technically blood on your hands if you decide to not pull it? I mean, I guess it, it, it depends on on how you're looking at it. Like, um, well, how you know, would you in, at in, in, in the first Spider Man, when, when Tobey Maguire did not stop the the robber from getting out and he killed Uncle Ben was there blood on his hands uh that's not fair you can't 
pull that out of thin air and make me put me on the spot like that. Because <laughs> yeah. like you know, just did him. He, he did. He didn't know way, that that yes, would be. Like, he didn't know that that would. That's like a butterfly effect. Like one thing led to another out of sight of his control. Yeah. But this is directly like you have the consequences of your choices, either or, right in front of you. I mean, yeah. e- either way, somebody's going to die though. Yeah. And one, there's more blood on my hands than. Well, that's what I'm asking because doing for nothing. Me, the uh, reason I'm asking for me is because if I do nothing, I don't think that there's blood on my hands. I don't. This like, is I have nothing to do with this. I'm the great observer in general, and especially on at this, like yeah. this beyond my control and means, and it's almost otherworldly. But I, if I choose to, if I make it a numbers game and I take a life on behalf of of the other four, that's me acting. On this impartially, or I don't know the right word to use, but I, I there is yeah. blood on my hands. I mean, I agree with that to an extent, but like, I don't know. Could you think of like another scenario where like just non acting would be bad? Because I mean, this one it's like you know someone's either gonna die either way, whether you react or not, whether there's blood on your hands or not, someone's gonna die. But what if it was just like one person could die? You see this, you could save them, and then you choose to do nothing. Like it's either that's you true. save yeah, them or or point. or not. You know, no one no one has to die. You could yeah, cause the no the one day, to die. The puppet then, master in control of this would be like you're basically choosing between four lives and one at the end of the day. Like yeah. that is what's going on here. And I see that. Like, you know, somebody walks onto a train and, and you know you know, maybe that that train is going to crash or there's a bomb on it or something. And you could have said, Hey, don't get on that dude. But you just like watch him get on. And yeah, that's chaos. And similar, but definitely different. Yeah. Because... I'm just saying that one, I would say that one, if you could stop somebody from getting dying and there's no repercussions from taking that action, I would say then kind of, you have blood on your hands. I would say so. I agree with you. I want to add on to what Adam said. I don't know if he has any, if there's any reason other than there being numbers game. But uh, do you think that there's a responsibility for as, as a not to get into gender roles, but uh, for a man to make a decision like that to save four women, and that that there's sort of like a mutual understanding between you and maybe the other guy on the tracks? Like, yeah, maybe my life is worth I giving up. That. Not, not really. Purely numbers game. All right. I mean, I would, I would feel that way, like slightly, almost I, like, I, I, at, I a, at an instinctual well. just level, but like but not, not wouldn't really affect the decision. Um, but now, like you know, what if like you know these are just four girls with not a lot going on. This guy here, he could be a father. He could be. The guy who would cure cancer, yeah. you know, or so you know, he could, you know, there could be more at stake than just one life. You know, what all is this guy responsible for? For versus these mm-hmm. girls who, you know, maybe they're just a bunch of That's college dropouts or at, something. At what point is it a numbers game and now like a bigger impact on society? Yeah, yeah. right. But we have no way to know that. But no, we have true. no way to Not know that. So it's maybe all... it's better to just do nothing. I. Uh, Honestly, I don't know. I mean, that that's one of the great questions, right? The trolley problem is one of those old-time philosophical uh, gauging questions that everybody's going to have a different answer for and different reasonings for their answers. But that was good. That was a good thought-provoking uh, conversation. Yeah. The man gets up off the track. He says, you did the right thing, son. I have a time machine. Let's go save these girls. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in that reality, they're still dead. Yeah. Okay. That that splintered off. I tried to I tried to make a happy scenario. Sorry. No happiness. Um somebody dies. But that's the so not death, but that's that that the, the theme of today's episode is kind of like morality questions. Game okay? theory. I love it. So Sounds good. If you have any uh that you would that's like, oh my gosh, this is a great one. Let me bring this one up. By all means, uh you go ahead. Um but just to keep the ball rolling, the next one that I have is 
it's a debate that is actually becoming more and more preva- prevalent today in today's society, military, uh, in today's military equipment, and how technology is constantly and very quickly advancing. And the debate or the morality question is at what point is autonomous weapons not allowed? So the question is, like, with the advancement of technology, autonomous weapons are capable of making life-and-death decisions. Should we allow machines to have the authority to take a human life without direct human control and responsibility? I.e., a drone has the ability to target, let's say, Russian soldiers on the front lines of Ukraine. They somehow have the ability to know that that is a Russian infantryman and drops bomb autonomously on top of these soldiers without any input from a Ukrainian soldier. I say no. No. Yeah, so, you know, the devil's advocate lives within me. I, I live with them every day. I could probably talk about this, but I my gut instinct is absolutely not. I can't, like, imagine. That's just Skynet waiting to happen. Uh, I mean, you're not wrong. That's, that's kind of, yeah. That's a tough bargain. I don't like the idea of fighting robots. That's a losing war, in my opinion, probably. So that I could see the argument, right? The the four crowd, and me personally, I'd say no as well. But I, I would say the four crowd could make the uh, argument that it would eliminate uh, any kind of timely errors. You know, so oh, to speak. Course. So, so like for instance, uh, we'll utilize like something like the Patriot missile system. Uh, Ukraine's using it right now. That because we gifted it to them, we being the U.S. Um, and they have been very successful in shooting down Scud missiles and shooting down uh, aircraft, fixed wing, both fixed wing and rotary wing Russian threats. And a lot of that is autonomous, uh, so to speak. It allows the operator to not have to constantly engage targets physically and allows it the system to autonomously defend an area right. quickly if, if if this uh missile were to you know there was a threat and it starts to engage is there like a period where you can override it and be like no putting in the code don't launch i or believe is just... there is an uh i mean i I can't. I'm not going to speak uh, speak to the specifics of the system. It's probably yeah. not a good, good idea, right? Um, I but, would just hope so. But I will say, like, I, I know for a fact that there are ways to make it autonomous, uh, so to speak. You know, there's definitely a human input that has to be done prior to it beginning to that point. Um, you have to make a conscious decision to make it defend an area by itself. But that that's the situation where this could be something beneficial to people because that, that Patriot missile system is ordinarily defending large cities. So if you have hesitation to engage a target because you're uncertain on if it's a threat or not, um, but it's flying in restricted airspace and it is rapidly approaching a uh, protected area, like uh, you know school children or whatever the case may be, but you hesitate and people die, that's the that's the four. If the uh, autonomous machine makes a mistake, kills an innocent, is the blood on the programmer's hands? Mm, programmer or or I wouldn't whoever. say no. I would say no as far as the programmer goes. I forget what happened when that Google car crashed into that woman. How did? What was the ruling on that? Did we just say, oh, it's just acted up? Or was I don't the people know. to blame? I, I'm sure Google probably settled out of court. If I had to if I have to take a guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But did someone get fired? Mm. You think? I, I don't know if that's something we'll ever know. <laughs> um but, to speak on no, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say the the missile defense systems though. Um I mean with those, there's a pretty, like, extremely low chance of casualties, right? Because it's not gonna, it's not gonna mistake a plane for a missile, is it? 
As a former Patriot missile operator, let me inform you that um, one of the last confirmed kills for U.S. was uh, a friendly NATO coalition uh, friendly force. Uh, we shot down a British tornado with, uh, I believe it was 13 souls on board, and they were all civilians. Um, the issue was that the Patriot missile system detected them as a threat because they were flying in restricted airspace, but their specific identify friend or foe uh, equipment, which all aircraft must have, um, was not squawking the correct code. It was un, It was not functional, but because it was flying in restricted airspace and the Patriot missile system picked it up as a threat and this was not autonomous let me let me say that it was not an autonomous fire uh they the patriot missile crew followed all procedures and attempted to make contact with the aircraft but they did not they were having issues with their communications equipment um the iff identify friend or foe being one of those pieces of equipment and they got shot down well oh man i mean that's whew. here's a question um is war a human trait like is it no is it is it something that is extremely human and won't stop unless we take that part of humanity out because no. i don't think i mean there's, it's hard to we, we don't really have much of a sample test with other species but it doesn't seem like yes, do. much war is waged between species that aren't like uh i mean i guess that's not true you'll get like animals doing this but like uh I guess what I was going to say is humanity is very flawed and will always be. I mean, it's, we're only human, obviously, and that if we want to see... It's impossible for us to invent utopia because of this. And if we want to see, in terms of like arguing the devil's advocate in favor of this, you will never see a utopia without handing up some of our humanity, our liberties, freedoms for a security based around autonomy. Ooh, I can't wait for the next question because you're really good at segueing that one in. But um, it's become to interrupt a hive you, mind. <laughs> yeah. become a hive mind. That's yeah, the only real way can, to become a utopia. Yeah, we have to do that so we could become a class five civilization and escape before our universe implodes upon itself. It's obviously yeah, no big deal. What was I going to say? Oh, I was going to respond to you said is it a human thing for war. We're getting off topic, but that's okay. Um, War, it, I, war as we know it, sure, human, definitely, uh, because we have a very, very uh, martial advancements to allow us to fight more efficiently and kill each other more efficiently than any other species on planet Earth, right? But chimpanzees are constantly in wars for air, for their specific areas, or or uh, the monkeys that fight over fig trees are constantly fighting over their turf. Um, let, let me ask you, because this is a very important distinction, is that I feel like they kind of have to because of survival. I feel like there's a lot of wars that we fight that have nothing to do with, let's say, survival and more of ambition and and conquest for the sake of honor, pride, the survive, like emboldening a nation, things like that, being in control of resources, which I guess in the biggest possible picture, you could say, like, oh, in order to make America, you know, survive we have to constantly be on top and monitor things but like i do think that that's different than territorial disputes or things that are so like ants like i was gonna say ants attacking another species that does seem more instinct and that they're not sitting around with count war councils and deciding we're going to attack the grasshoppers it just seems like what they do as opposed to we 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 plot out the destruction of nations just because we're asked to you know war with that regard it seems a little different i i mean yes is it different for sure is it only different because we have the intellect to make it that you know advanced and uh, apply that much forethought that's my answer uh, if, yeah. the, if any other species had the capabilities of uh higher intellect, thinking. yeah of, of higher thinking then they yeah. would be on the it exact same be like uh the, the fatal flaw of intelligence and self-awareness is that yeah. Okay. Seven, I mean, you said, is it, a, is it a human thing? Since we're the only ones who possess that amount of intelligence now that we know of, confirmed. But it's so funny far. to you're, you. You immediately went to monkeys, which is funny because we are sort of uh, on the same 
we are monkeys in a sense. We're not very far off. Like, well, that what was the it's... first thing that came to mind. What about emus? Emus had a great a war in Australia. The Great Emu War. The Great Emu War was a real thing. It was the uh, what were the casualties? Oh, Large. <laughs> if we if <laughs> I'll look it up. You keep talking. Maybe like there's probably somewhere where a monkey started a war because he just wanted like. You know, he's like, I want this monkey's big stick or something that he's carrying. What if it really is a monkey thing? Like, we always envision, like, if there's an alien race and they visit Earth, they might just be, like, without prejudice, be like, uh, we're just going to destroy this planet for its resources. It might be, like, such a universal thing that it's it goes beyond our planet even. But what if it doesn't? What if we're just monkey people who are just do monkey things and war is a big part of that? I mean, it could be. Also, what if what if aliens come down? They see us fighting amongst themselves, or like these guys—they're not team players. We cannot like allow them into our giant galactic round table of different civilizations where we make that space be, rules because they that. they can't even. Uh, you know, they're having civil wars down here. If they can't work as a team player, then fuck them. That'd be, that's, them. That'd be really horrible because I am guarantee you that those races have had their own history of... Yeah. But, like, there's no way, if you look at our planet now and see New York City and yeah. the internet and not come to the conclusion that we're extremely well with working with one another. Because I'd say, like, at the, at the end of the day, there's yeah. barely war, but there's Someone. absolute nonstop working together. You know I, mean, I mean, even, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Even if there is, like, advanced alien races who are this hive mind or something now, like, they probably weren't just born that way. They probably had to have evolved from something like we did. Like, maybe we're not done evolving yet either. Hopefully mm-hmm. not, because we kind of suck right now. We're pretty weak. I'm we're sorry. Doing- I've, I've been completely engulfed in researching the Great Emu War ever since we brought it up. Um, the only oh, thing yeah. I could find is that there's a claimed amount of 986 emus killed, 2,500 wounded, um, and over a thousand soldiers took part in the quote unquote war. But Australia seems to not be willing to give an actual number if any soldiers sustained any sort of casualties. I don't know why they'd be hesitant to release that type of information, but it seems as if they are. So I can't give you any kind of uh, definitive answer on if any casualties were sustained for this uh, human population. Um, but there were a, it's a minimal, the website says, a minimal impact on the em- emu population as a whole. I think the emu paid off the uh, Australian officials. Well, but... I think the Australian yeah. officials are too uh, disheartened to say that any of their soldiers were injured against an emu war uh, effort. Anyway... Um, wow, people died uh, in the great emo war. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brand new versus taking back Sunday. <laughs> Damn, I don't know that. Oh, I'm not yeah, I'm not Google that I one. used to always be on the side of brand new but until like recently when he's kind of creepy. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? Maybe, maybe he was the weird one. Um, maybe. The uh, you segued into the next one that I was going to ask Christian mid mid uh, conversation, but I'll try to not. I'll, I'll try to get back on to that one. Um, the next morality question I had was, I guess, a quantity over quality type question, right? So think back two thousand one. Obviously, everyone understands the impact of 9-11 and what that did as far as our national security. And the I believe you all are somewhat at least vaguely familiar with the Patriot Act was, right? And what that did as far as allowing the government to tap into basically anything that they claimed could lead to a a uh, potential terrorist threat in in anything. So that includes any of your cell phones, any of your hard lines, uh, connectivities, uh, anything on your smartphones. So the government had full reign as long as, because of the Patriot Act, they were able to basically tap into anything. And that leads into the question, what 
uh, what, where is the line as far as allowing for the sake of national security, say that we knew like as a country that we are going to war. Okay. For, I don't know where, I don't know who I really care. We're going to war. The, and we're very worried about terrorist attacks. Is the Patriot Act allowed to be reenacted to its fullest extent? Or is it allowed to be even farther, more, because of the potential uh, increase in technology that's happened since then? Where is the line, morality-wise, that we must draw on the sand uh, for allowing oversight? Very easy back there. Way back there. Very, very easy. Uh, fuck the government. Um, I will say that, let's just, I'm assuming we're, we're not to get into conspiracies, but just going to assume that 9-11 happened the way it is. They said it did, and and the reasonable cause was there for them to do this, even under those circumstances, I'm against it. Yet alone, all the circumstances where... 9-11 had more shady shit going on behind it and wasn't... Let's just say, like, may- maybe even they weren't the puppet masters behind the whole thing, but they f- they framed it in a way to make this pass and, and without public scrutiny. Uh, again, then, even then, I'm like, hell no. Like, But don't ask me to explain that, because I really don't know much about how far they're willing to go. I just know that privacy is important. So it, what you're saying is you would you would sacrifice a potential nuclear disaster in a city for for your uh security on on online. That's a little bit extreme. I I it's don't not. That's that, that's the I, whole situation. <laughs> okay, have we had like a sum of all fears situation happen that I'm not aware about where like civilians have somehow like ex mercenaries have found a way to bring a nuke into New York City or something, uh, because well, un- under those circumstances, uh, yeah, if that happens, sh- uh, but based on what the ahead. Wagner Group, right, where they were headed in Russia, whenever they had declared a, a coup against Putin, they were headed to a nuclear arms facility that was created during the Cold War. What they manufactured there were nuclear backpack bombs. Literally bombs that were designed for infantrymen to carry on their back that were nuke that were tiny nukes that they could bring in on behind enemy lines to infiltrate and destroy. So the idea that I've never even heard of these things before. Well, that's terrifying. That's where the Wagner group was headed to potentially use. Okay. Against, and against and so, Putin or against us or against Ukraine? Who knows? But that's beside the point. Your question is are there things like that? There are 100% things like that. And so you're, you're willing to. I'm, I'm, I'm not actually saying like you're making the wrong choice. I'm just, you know. No, I'm I know what you're saying. No, you, you it have out. to word it like that. I need you to word it like that for me to even nudge in a different direction. I get what you're saying. Uh, now that I've learned that these things exist, that they're <laughs> that there are backpack nukes, that was um, Cold War. Imagine what could be out there now. I get that because Cold War, like this, was kind of like in the early stages of mutually assured destruction. It's like we can, you know, I'm sure one side was thinking they can nuke the other and get away with it at some point. But uh, uh, you know, that's crazy to me. Yeah. So I don't know much about the technology that exists in 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 security, national security. Like, what metrics do or things do we have that would prevent people from being able to sneak those into our country? Like, obviously you can't get them through plane. That'd be hard. We we have a pretty big navy through the Atlantic. I'm sure like, you can't just submarine nukes into our place. Like, how do we? How does? I mean, man, people come on into America all the time. There are constant Russian and Ukrainian refugees going across the Mexican border today. Like it right. happens all the time. So yeah, the thing you're that, right. So. And so here's the, here's the devil's advocate. Where is the line that the government is allowed to constantly observe? That are we, they allowed? We have technology to that 
detects like you uto- like plutonium concentrations or whatever you, whatever it is that nukes I don't are know. Made of. uranium I, I, I'm purely saying that they would have the capability to constantly search for trigger words or phrases in people's text messages or their phone conversations that may allow them to generate a list of possible, you know, people who are sympathetic to a terrorist cause or whatever the case may be. I don't know. It's whatever that they're doing. All to- right, I'm I'm willing to find middle ground here. I will say this. They can do whatever they want so long. I mean, if this was if their goal was protecting national security and and stopping bo- backpack bombs from going off downtown, I'd be willing to let them do what's at their whatever's at their disposal as long as anything else they find in the process that may be illegal cannot be used against you. Um, sure, if, we'll get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. Like they can't be like, oh, we found <laughs> out that this dude was a hardcore big name drug dealer in this region because somehow he was implicated through someone, through someone, through someone, through someone who may be a part of a, a terrorist organization. And now we've got to pursue this with some other department, but like, no, that you should be exonerated. Of it. You should have immunity to anything. If you're being spied on, as long mm-hmm. as while you're being spied on is in pursuit. Even of, if you're uh, a serial killer. Or- yeah, abs- uh, yeah, I'd got to say like probably <laughs> it's got to be an all or nothing thing because the moment you start being yeah, like all right, I we're going to Where do you draw the line? Where do you yeah. draw the line? That's Okay, that's so the... you're willing to trust the government to uh get I'm will of- yeah, I'm willing not- to I wouldn't say the words trust. Yeah, I wouldn't say the trust, but as long as there's something <laughs> written in law defended by the Supreme Court, uh I could live with it because yeah. I can okay. I can accept serial killers as a part of the human experience. But atomic right. bombs in downtown, that's where I draw the line at the human experience. That's when like you got to yeah, mix that. when it's genocide. Um, okay, you guys heard it here first. Christian supports the government fully in their decision to monitor everything that you're doing online. I'm getting out of here. Wow, you, 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 you handle information just like everybody else online. This is, what am, is this Twitter? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you got me in an emotional state because now I just found I got something to be afraid yeah. of now. No, I'm um, saying so, I'm I'm not I'm not down with that. I'm I'm saying no. I'm still saying no. I mean, they pretty Hard much no. they they pretty much can see anything they want to, anyways. And well, here's the well, don't that's, tell me that's you're what not. I was you say. can you can be this crazy hippie, and you're like, all right, boys, it's fine. I'm deleting my Facebook. I'm gonna get off the grid. I'm gonna <laughs> live out there on the sticks. You can't tell me there isn't like a fucking satellite up in the sky that's just like haha yeah, we got you anyways a, fucker that's a big point if it's the wild wild west and there's no laws on the books and they're gonna spy on you anyways because the technology exists and we're all networked yeah i kind of would like to have that that thing in place since we know they're gonna do it anyways if they want to well here's okay. the thing though i think anybody who is uh in such a it sounds bad to say elite when you're talking about terrorists, but I don't know of a better word, an elite group to be, you know, uh, planning an attack of such a massive scale, I think they would know how to use end-to-end encryption, guys. There's some way that they can communicate without the government being able to break it. I mean, there's, there's always people slipping up. Right? Was it 9/11 you know. done by? I mean, according to them, done by a bunch of fucking amateurs, like box cutters leaving passports lying around on the ground. Like, yeah. I know that's it's all buys into a whole different conversation, but like, I don't think the the best. There's always going to be whole cracks in the the foundation, or you know, I mean, like, you can try and encrypt everything, but there's going to be a mistake, and if that one tiny thing allows you to get caught. It would it'd be nice to have something there to, to uh, you know, to stop a nuclear explosion from happening because of one tiny little mistake from these elite terrorists. Yeah, I think there. Yeah, I think it's right. There's definitely going to be a mistake somewhere, and even if it isn't them, if if they're monitoring everyone, they, these terrorists could just be near, like a normal person, and maybe that's picked up in conversation through something. On, on another person's phone who's not a terrorist who doesn't have encryption yeah and this is from the perspective of someone who's very pro like pro human at the end of the day like i'm very optimistic i don't think humanity is a parasite that needs to be you know i'm not like 
edgy. Like, I do love humanity and the explosion of what we are, and I do hope that we make it into the next frontier and we just populate space and we just have this amazing history. So, yeah, I do think nukes and things like that are a big... Uh, one or two or three bad place nukes at certain areas could set us back a thousand years. Like, oh, I, sure. I don't think, like... W- what is the what is the worst case aspect of losing our privacy? If you, most people, and when I say most, I mean like ninety. People something do weird shit. Percent, they do, but I'm saying the vast amount of people are just kind of living day to day shit, yeah. not doing yeah. anything that's worth anything. That's, f- that's what you think. Yeah, if you want to also um, to be really scared, Christian, yeah. um, uh-huh. not not talking about nukes anymore, but just, you know, natural phenomena. Yeah, look up solar flares and how they could damage us and destroy everything that we know. Yeah, that's easy. I've Dale taught me about solar flares in like grade school whenever we that one Halloween yeah. where the sky was red, he was just like, Oh, this is a solar flare. We could all be killed momentarily and I'm just like, What the fuck? I think we've all watched a little bit of Dragon Ball Z, Sean. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> Goku is is on our side, I think. You know, yeah. he'll 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 wish us all back. One 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 more thing about you know I know Adam's talking about like all the encryption and shit. Like uh, like what about the guy who who like founded uh, the Silk Road? Like you know how they caught him, right? Right. Like, all that. The, the... Like he had a key. Or, you know, he had some way to just, like, fucking nuke everything, wipe it out at, like, a, a second's notice. So, like, there was no way he could get caught. And then, like, he's in a library. There's, like, a fake lover spat going on. It's actually, like, two people yeah. undercover. They take his laptop. He's done. Yeah, that was crazy. I remember uh, about uh, hearing about that. Well, the, re- the the real reason they tracked him down was through the way that he typed the way that he spoke he had when it, in an operation like that you have to have some kind of forward facing presence that's a little different than direct messages between two people involved in a plot um he <clears throat> had to present his wares and they were able to match his grammar style with things that he had written in his real life identity which is kind of crazy to think about, but yeah, yeah, that's how it happened. Also, I think they should let him go, but that's just me. <laughs> um, all right, you guys ready to move on to the <laughs> Mind last... trouble for saying that? No, no, no. Uh, yeah. The last morality question. I feel like it'll take us enough time to debate or talk about it. Unless you yeah. all have one that's a burning desire to ask. No, I didn't. I, I'm sure mm-hmm. I will come up with one later, but I don't have one on the spot. Okay. Yeah. This is the criminal reformation morality dilemma. So, suppose a person commits a severe crime but shows genuine remorse, uh, actively seeking out rehabilitation and demonstrates a significant personal growth during their prison sentence. Should they be given a chance for early release or reduced sentencing based on their transformation? Or say that they have life in prison as a sentence um, where there is no possibility of parole or no possibility of escaping prison for their lifespan entirely. Because we all know an actual lifespan, I think, is only, or a life sentence is like 20 years. So you could get a life sentence and still actually get out. But if you have multiple life sentences, then you're done, right? Let's say someone has multiple life sentences because they committed a very heinous crime. And they have changed morally. They are a different person entirely, and there is pro- there is no possibility of them actually pr- uh, redoing this act or or being the person that they once were. Is is that something that you could potentially forgive? And I'll I'll even give you a more specific example: the Skylar Niece situation. Because Rachel Schoff, the person who, one of the people that were complicit and also an active participant in her murder, was recently up for parole. She did not get her parole, but um, there are a large amount of people that would say that she has changed. She's found religion and she's morally, you know, changed entirely as a human being and she deserves a second chance. Um, I mean... 
This is easy for me. I think obviously, yes. Not obviously, because it's not that obvious. But yeah, I mean, like, I've seen Shawshank Redemption. I love the ending of that movie, and everyone deserves a chance. But uh, specifically that one, I'm not opposed to the idea of her eventually getting out. I don't know the yeah. specifics. She was, I mean, they were kids, you know, and even though it was like very premeditated, um, a kid's mind is so it's 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 so fuzzy and I think uh, it's a little early though right now. I understand I say, why it yeah, was yeah, not yeah. approved. I agree hundred percent. I would say and this will probably not be a, like how they would ever do it, but since um and, and, I mean I think it should be on a case by case basis for mm-hmm. one. I mean that maybe that's obvious. Um but I think it should almost be up to the the victim's parents. If if or they relatives. can find a, yeah, that's a, in good... a way to forgive her, you that's know, and I mean she better good... be like, you know, doing something for these people. She, you know, better be down on her hands and knees begging for forgiveness and, and you know, she, you know, maybe she sh- she should probably spend her whole life you know, you're never going to replace that person who was lost, but she should just like probably dedicate her life to just doing anything she can to like repair like the pain that this family is feeling. And I think if, if she does that and they find a, some way to forgive her, then, then yes, mm. that's, that's a very big if, but that's, goes alongside my philosophy with the death penalty too, not to divert it, but like a big thing about like I've once, I've said I think to you guys too that if the the family, the the real, the, the absolute closest victims to a crime like that uh, if if they want this is kind of dicey, but they should be able to the ones to either okay I don't know what I'm really trying to say. Actually, I don't even. I, I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. I know exactly what you're trying not, to say. I don't. Oh. I don't want to be on camera. On, no, I'm not saying. I don't even know uh, if they would want to do that. Some of them might. Some of them like. I, you kinda, yeah. Some of them even might think they might be the ones to to to, you know, do it, and then they have a lifetime of regret as well. Exactly. That's so, very true. Yeah. But no, I'm with you 100. percent That kind of goes in yeah. a similar mentality where, like, if the family can forgive them then the state and the society should be able to since they have really nothing to do with this the family has everything to do with this Um, i used to think very differently about stuff like the death penalties but now i'm like the older i get the more i understand like watching like old shit like batman cartoons and stuff i'm like dude batman could just kill this guy and it would be over with but then like the more i watch it i'm like no, Batman's right. Like, no matter how bad these people are, it's just better to bring them in and lock them up and not have to deal with that. That's a good point. Like, I don't That's know. Like, I, I've kind of like, always loved that. That's the idea that Batman isn't the killer vigilante kind of. Yeah. And I, I used to be very death penalty, because, but it went alongside of my view on life in general i didn't really see much inherent value in it as much as i do now where i'm just like this this sanctity of life is wasn't as powerful in my mind as the way i see it now where you know someone's life from beginning to end it's so dynamic and ever-changing yeah that who someone is when they're young and they commit an atrocious crime can can actually be an entirely different person than you are towards the end of your life for sure and and then there's a point of a part of me that thinks like, is this because am I becoming better in some way? Or is it maybe just secretly because like, you know, being a kid, you never have that feel like you, you, you always hear like, you know, Oh yeah. One day everybody dies, but you never like for me, I didn't truly understand that till like late twenties, early thirties. And I'm like, I'm getting old life is fragile. i am gonna die like i always yeah. knew i'm gonna die but like now i really know i'm gonna die and i'm like oh man life is a much bigger deal than i thought it was and like no matter what somebody does do i have the right to take that away who am i to be that judge 
Like I get in the heat of the moment, like somebody That's breaks exactly. into your house, you're trying to protect your family. For sure, you might need to kill that person. And I understand, but like when you have them in custody locked up, there's no way they're escaping. They're not going to dig themselves out with spoons. At that point, I'm like, I mean, I know we're paying money to keep them alive, but I mean, a life is a life. That's exactly why I say what I said with the whole, if the, the family or the victim of the, of the de- the lost life can't push the button themselves to cause the death of the person who committed the crime, why is, why does it done on behalf of society? Like I understand our law was broken, but if the family can't even mm-hmm. make the decision to end the life because they themselves couldn't live with the loss of life. Cause they also see life as being this huge thing extraordinary thing that maybe the whole death penalty should be reassessed but you know yes. wow we could go down a rabbit hole there for a while um <laughs> not to cut you off but uh Probably that missed. well i it's a very that is a subject that is obviously a very hot ticket item uh, it doesn't matter who you talk to everyone's gonna have a very different answer uh nuanced answer based off of their belief system and everything um but to summarize your answers i believe we have two yeses and adam what was yours what, what was the initial question <laughs> <laughs> basically uh, the question is would you be for oh, in dense. favor of yeah. oh yeah you're right 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 um yeah, but let me restate it so that way if someone is actually listening to the sauce if if you are for or against the idea that someone could have potentially earned a lighter sentence or a, cha- a different sentence based off of uh, them learning morality and had, had completely changed their outlook and so on if if do prisoners who commit heinous crimes earn different outcomes of their prison sentence based off of what they have or who they have become uh, i'm gonna say generally yes um but with some caveats i think you really have to let them simmer in there for a good while uh, you can't just say somebody changed after five years, ten years. Mm. I'd say minimum twenty. Yeah, that that probably more like curry has to simmer for a while. <laughs> yeah, and there's also instances where, like, even if they do show, like, if if you kill like your three kids and your wife in the gruesome way, like, right? I there can... are some that it's just or your yeah, uh, it's an all or nothing. I I, I, I I'm I'm. I'm going to have well, to hold no, you well, to it. No, 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 because I think we established that everything should be looked at case by case. Um, okay. Yeah. All or nothing. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I can't like... do all or nothing. If we do all or nothing, then. So, th- so you're saying there are people that are, have committed too right. heinous of an act to yes. ever be reconsidered for. And, for sure. Yes. And, and maybe yeah. they do it late enough in their life that you know that there's not enough time. To even maybe they get to go to a nice yeah. prison, but they don't get out. Uh, you know, like if somebody committed mass murder and we know for sure it was them, there was, you know, videotape evidence of it. We're talking like more than three deaths at once, school shooters, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, no chance. I'm also willing to put out there not to be ageist or whatever, but like there is an argument to be made about anything that you really do before you're 30 or 25 and your brain is still being developed that like that should be taken into consideration because so there's so much passion and exu and like exuberant force of life within the y- youth that you're always making stupid rash decisions in the heat of moments and there's there's you sort of lose a lot of that as you age and if you're doing stone cold acts of fucking evil when you're in your 50s you probably are fucked up and are unable to change Whereas if you do that exact crime at the age of 19 or 23 or something, there is an element of lo- no control, loss of control, because you are subject to your own fatal flaws or whatever the fuck I'm trying to say. But you know what I'm trying to say. 
Yeah, my brain's definitely a lot different since then. Um, and I, I'll, I'll bring up one other thing that I think, uh, you know, is kind of interesting. And this was this was a Sam Harris thing. I'm not trying to bring uh like free will into this. That's a whole nother topic. But like one of the things he was an example is like it was like five different murderers. You know, like one of them had abusive parents. You know, one of them had a brain tumor that was like causing some stuff to go wrong with them. One of them perfectly normal life. You know, I, I can't remember every single one. I'm just like, you know, what if, you know, brain tumor, something was causing this guy to be crazy. They remove it. And he's just like, Oh dude, what, what the hell did I do? You know? Yeah. What about that situation? Is yeah. he still held accountable? That's that's a tough call. You're that's gonna feel whole... a lot different about him than, than just like the the rich white boy with the perfect family. Like, why did you do yeah, it, I think, dude? I think on the case of the brain tumor, you could probably argue in court that maybe an insanity case. Um but in terms of like psychological trauma, like having an that might not be seen as, as important. But I do think that it is just as much has an effect on what you do as a person, regardless of how they see it. In court, because yeah. one's like a tangible, like you can be like, all right, I can see the effects of the brain because the tumor is sitting right there in this part that fucks up this part of the brain that's able to make decisions. But I feel like everyone's got such so, like different levels of trauma in their lives. It's hard to make an, a, a measurement that is able to be used in court. Yeah. Um. So it sounds like three yeses to me. Uh, case by case yeah. basis, I think is what was established, but. What's your opinion? Yeah, yeah. Good question. I I would have to tend to agree with your your sentiment, the group's sentiment here that it's a case case by case basis that has to be looked at, but let me ask you this specifically. What about the Rachel Schofflin? Do you think that she could eventually be let out? So I have a personal bias, I suppose because I actually knew her to some extent because she dated a really good friend of mine uh, in high school. And so I actually knew her. And whereas Sheila Eddie, it, it, we get into the weeds of that for a very long time, but I believe the end state of that was where both actions from Sheila Eddie and Rachel show were incredibly un, unforgiving. Uh, I, I think Rachel Schof was. Which one was the puppet master, more or less? Sheila Eddy. Was okay. So, so Schof is more like she was. Schof was. I don't was want to kill her. Yeah, she had. So you you're definitely stronger about this when it comes to Eddie and yes, like, even both and similar. She's a certified narcissist, and I have much less remorse and that's why I have a, a whole bunch of bias against it. So if you're asking me that specific situation, do I think Rachel Schof deserves some sort of leniency potentially? Uh, but it, it, it's, Oh, it, this was what? 10 years ago, 10 ish years ago. Uh, that was in 2010, I believe. 2010. Or, or maybe it was 2012 yeah. actually. No, it would have, so I think she murdered her in 2011, maybe, and then I That's joined. Weird. I joined the army, and then I, they didn't arrest her, or those two until like 2013, because I think it was like two years of investigative work, or 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 an entire year at the minimum. But regardless, I think uh, for that one, potentially uh, they could be looked at for. Some sort of leniency, if they if there is any certifiable way to ensure and evaluate that their morality had improved and changed. I don't know how you do that personally. I have no idea how you would one would actually get a quantifiable measurement of someone's morality um, after before and after going into the prison system. No idea. So that that that's a whole other can of worms, man. I. In a broad answer, yes, I think there is a potential for a reduction in prison sentence or whatever the case may be 
for someone who has significantly changed their moral fiber. But yeah. for that specific situation, too much. I think that's what we're all saying. Yes, with an asterisk. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. And I think that's what the, the system is as well. I mean, that's the whole the whole parole system, basically, in a nutshell. Um, Nobody entirely... wants you to think that way, though. They want you to say yes or no. Yeah. On pretty much any hot topic nowadays. Well, it's ever, you know, yeah. It's just like, Everybody wants to put words in your mouth like I did for Christian earlier. Yeah, any, he's a any, strong any supporter sort of, of government oversight. Hey, any sort, but of, you also, sort of like rights movement, if you like, you're like, I'm not disagreeing with you, but this one thing, they're like, you're terrible. You're a terrible <laughs> human being. Fuck you. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, any final thoughts to send us off before I finish I this like out? Any thought that I could possibly have is just going to spiral us into another. Um, yeah. Yes. I figure that's probably the case. <laughs> be, be a good human. There you go. Human. <laughs> well, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. If you stayed this long, then I hope you'll check out some of our other episodes. My favorite by far still is our Tasteless Tirades Let's Talk About Food episode, um, which we also talked about the death penalty in that for a long, long time. So apparently we have a theme here. Um, if you like the show... I encourage you to follow us on Instagram so you can be well informed on when the next episode comes out uh, as soon as I actually start to edit them. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.